Sit. Stay. This was your revenge. I fear I've bamboozled myself by making you watch this. Season 2 of Faster Greg really goes off the rails when it introduces executive producer Jesus Christ to its opening credits on every episode. I haven't been this angry at something we reviewed since that time when Magic Christmas thing back at Mary Steen Virgin. Actually, I take that back. This makes me more angry. The show thinks it's being so humble by giving all the credit to God. But really, what it comes across as is, ah, but we're the show that Jesus approved. What do you have, Dick Wolf? It was bad enough when you when you called yourself uh, Proof God has a sense of humor and comedy the way that God intended, but now you're humble bragging in the opening credits of every episode. I stand before you a humble man. All choked up with humbleness and humility. I was born right here in Mayberry, of humble parents, in a humble home. Gerflix thinks you're overdoing it a little. If Jesus were to get into television, which I suppose would be within the realm of possibility, the man was a storyteller, I like to think he would have some sense of continuity and consistency with his characters. This season gets even worse about its continuity and its characters. Uh, for starters, we have a new Lori. And she's introduced in an episode with a previously on that shows the old Lori. Now, in Pastor Greg's defense, other shows have done this before, most famously Bewitched. But, um, Dick York and Dick Sargent actually looked alike. These two lorries do not. Importantly, it was also made clear up front, this is still Darren. Had it not been for a one-off line where John addresses her by name, like three minutes after she's already been on screen, we wouldn't know that this was Lori. We thought it was a different secretary. And... In our defense, she's not really written like the old Lori right away, in that apparently the will they or won't they, which was such a defining part of both Greg and Lori's characters, was resolved in between seasons. Great job there. And Lori has been in a relationship with this new guy named Matt. Um, have we met Matt? We have not met Matt. Matt. But they're already so serious in their relationship that Matt is ready to propose to her. So Frank and Flo, who had a potential love interest last season, both of those are gone. Both of those girlfriends are gone. But Lori, who was not in a relationship last season, is engaged. Speaking of Frank... Oh, don't tell me he gets recast too. No, but within the first episode, Flo overhears him rehearsing some lines for a play and comes to the misunderstanding that Frank is leaving town. Ah, the classic misunderstanding gag. A sitcom favorite. But wait! There's more! Oh no. Turns out, the misunderstanding was completely correct by accident because Frank is leaving town! He's going to Hollywood to become an actor, a dream he's never mentioned before. You're kidding, right? There are all kinds of ways you could send this character off. You could have it turn out that things really were working out between him and that girlfriend you introduced to him to for an episode last season, and she lives far away, and he's moving to a new town to be closer to her. Or he's got a sick mother that he's got to take care of or something. But nope. Um... Frank up and all of a sudden wants to be an actor, and he's always wanted to be an actor, even though this has never come up before, so the church needs a new custodian, and the town needs a new mayor, apparently, because, um, as we mentioned in passing, the show mentioned in passing, that Frank was the mayor. Can a mayor just skip town like that? At least Jean Valjean was arrested by the law. But it's okay, because we still have Flo! All right. And John! Kill me. 
and, and Cat for a little while. <laughs> and Carter. Who dat? Oh, that, that's Carter. Uh, he was in a couple of episodes last season, I think, though I don't think he was mentioned by name. Anyway, he also helps out with the with the youth group now. Oh. Hello. Uh, new blood. I can get behind that. And as is par for the course in this show, he's also kind of a jerk. Dang it. We also have Missy. Wasn't she Greg's ex who wanted to sleep with him in that one episode last season? Uh-huh. She's back now? Uh-huh. And she's also a Christian now, so it's all okay for them to get back together. That seems like a low bar. Oh, and you're gonna love this. Uh, Matt and Lori and Greg and Missy are gonna have a double wedding. That's a terrible idea. Isn't it, though? Especially because... Greg and Lori were considering dating four months ago. Not to mention, it does seem like you should be engaged for longer than a few weeks before you're getting married, but I guess TV shows do have a tendency to speed up real life, so I guess I don't know why I'm surprised. This is just especially speedy. Uh, but this scenario does bring in a couple of more new characters, like Greg's mother. Hey, Nathan. Does she look familiar to you? Well, her ringtone is literally the Gilligan's Island theme song. Flo and John dress up like Gilligan and the Skipper for Greg's bachelor party. I'm going to guess she's Bob Denver. That's very funny. Don Wells has joined the cast for season two, and they really want you to know that she's in this show now. Of course, she's only in it for two episodes, but hey, name recognition is everything. It, it's it's like Adam Lambert in the Ten Commandments musical all over again. But wait! There's more! Oh no. With four episodes left in the season, Greg gets reassigned to a different church, so we get a completely new cast of characters. Is this at least set up? You're right, I expect too much of this show. No, the first time that this move is ever mentioned, Greg and Missy are already en route in the car. And we don't even get a proper goodbye to the characters we allegedly loved for over a season. So, great, new slate of characters. There's Joe... There's this new secretary, Mac. There's this blonde lady who's the other secretary whose name escapes me right now, even though she's also on the front of the box. You know, this box is really strange. If you look really closely at it, you'll see all these new characters from the last four episodes are prominently in the front, while the characters that are actually from season one and the beginning of season two are squished in the back like this. They're, they're trying to make it seem like they're expanding their cast, but all that's really happening is they're just trading out interchangeable faces for more interchangeable faces. Okay, I do have one question, though. Why does Carter get to go to the new church? Carter? Yeah. Um... I'm sorry, you don't live with Greg and Missy. Why did you move at the same time and to the same location that they did? I don't know. Is he a youth pastor now? Yes, and that guy is one of his teenagers. Uh, no, that man is 35. No, he's a teenager. <laughs> okay, <laughs> sure. There's also this character named Courtney, and she does live with Greg and Missy. Okay. Hello, when did you get introduced? Oh, just now. Um, does she instigate any conflicts? Does she impact their lives in any way? No, she has a subplot about a stressful job, but it all happens off screen. She doesn't interact with 
any of these characters throughout the course of the episode outside of Greg and Missy. And like many others before her, she is gone after this one episode, never to be mentioned again. This dumb. But she does lead to one funny scenario. Um, she's sitting with Missy in this super fake living room set. She's talking about how grateful she is that they they brought her in to live with them, but how stressful her job is, and Missy tells her she just needs to relax. Oh, huh. I don't know if we were going with this. Pastor Greg has become its own porn parody. No, it hasn't. Yes, it has. This is the introduction of a porno. Prove me wrong. You know what? We're just going to move on. But wait! There's more! Oh, no. According to the IMDb listings, season three goes back to the old cast, and we don't see here from the new cast again. So, we left the old cast and introduced an entire new cast for four episodes only to drop these characters and go back to the old ones. Why? What was the point? It's especially weird because the new church is where it, the show has the most structure. Because of course it is. It doesn't become good by any stretch, but it's a step in the right direction. We actually see more of Greg's sermons. We see the events throughout the week that that inspire him to write a sermon. We see him inspiring his parishioners. This should have been the format of the show the whole time! You know, Nathan, we do have a whole season before we get to these last four episodes. Let, let's, let's rewind a little bit. What have our allegedly beloved residents of Merlin Church been up to this year anyway? Besides weddings. Well... We start with by resolving a cliffhanger left from season one about how they're going to lose the church. I don't remember that one. There were some episodes we couldn't watch, so I'm willing to give them the benefit of the doubt. Not a whole lot, because a cliffhanger like that really ought to be the last season, the last episode of a season, which we know for a fact was the marriage counseling one. But some wiggle room. Uh, we should probably clarify that they're not so much going to lose the church as much as they are going to lose the land that the church is on. They have a place they can relocate to, and they've said as much. So this isn't necessarily the impending crisis that the congregation thinks it is. Oh, I should, by the way, mention that Greg himself doesn't seem to think this is a crisis at all. So if he doesn't care, why should we? Come to find out... The rich man who bought the church's land did so because the the cross on top of their roof shines directly into his window at night and affects his sleep. Oh, okay. gee. What stakes? Okay. One, that cross doesn't look anything like the cross on the roof of the church. I happen to know this because you're using that dang church for every establishing shot. And two, they're always talking about budget problems. So turn the light off. No, no. Apparently John, the guy who's concerned about the budget all the time, his brilliant plan is to arrange a task force without Greg's permission to go up on the roof and take the cross off. That is needlessly complicated, sir. Ugh. This show is so bad on the surface, but the closer you look at it, the worse it gets. It's fractally bad. And then there's another Christmas episode, because that went so well last season. Just in case you forgot, Lori reminds you by telling Missy the story of last Christmas, complete with flashbacks. There's just one problem! One problem? There's just one problem in particular I'd like to talk about. Okay. This is from the unaired version of the Christmas episode. You know how I know? That's the wrong Frank in the elevator! Because of course it's the wrong Frank in the elevator! 
<laughs> That's funny is I don't really see the narrative purpose for a character telling the story of the last episode to another character, especially since your main episode is an entirely new story. This year, our merry band of heroes is going to go to a church conference in Hawaii. They're really excited to go. Unfortunately, thanks to bad weather, their connecting flight gets snowed in and they are unable to go to Hawaii or back home. They're just stuck there. Hilarity ensues as they try to fend for themselves using only the food that Greg brought in his jacket. Okay, if you can't afford airport food, how were you going to afford Hawaii when you got there? Also trapped at the airport are three astronomers on their way to Bethlehem, Pennsylvania to announce the discovery of a new star. And a band. Mind you, the band is not called the Shepherds or anything. I'd even accept it if they were the Flock by Night and their manager was the Shepherd Analog. But they're really on the nose with the Magi and then just the flaming cabbage? You're inconsistent with your blatant imagery. And you know what? You already did this. You know how I know? Because you had a flashback to it in this very episode! At least the Mary, Joseph, and Jesus analog are refugees, so that's nice. And... Our Mary gets to give this heartfelt speech about their situation. Oh, and uh, they're on a literal flight to Egypt, by the way. Ugh. This is undercut by our characters going, Hey, this is just like in the Bible! Completely undermining the fact that these are real people. This is the same problem that I take with the Christmas shoes. Basically, the idea is, God put these p miserable people in front of me so I can feel special about myself. All of this is intercut with Kat delivering the Christmas Eve service because her father was unavailable and Carter's incompetent. So once again, everyone else is doing Greg's job instead of him. And you know what? She actually does deliver a pretty good sermon. Too bad it's basically the last time we see her in the show. And by the way, Nathan, look, they're rolling the credits while she's talking again. No! Stop doing that! <laughs> then there's an episode where Greg and John decide to go fishing and drop a sermon into Flo's lap at the last minute to be delivered that evening. And they think it's one big joke about how Flo was so flustered to have this revealed to him during the morning announcements. That really wasn't very nice. No! <laughs> during those same announcements, Greg unknowingly reveals that Lori's parents' anniversary date is given incorrectly, which causes Lori to unwittingly realize she was conceived out of wedlock. The shock, the horror... While on their fishing trip, Greg and John get lost somehow and wander into a biker bar. A biker bar in the middle of a forest. Okay then, I didn't know we were into surreal humor, but apparently we're into surreal humor now. These bikers, upon learning that Greg is a minister, demand that he marry them right away. But he has to do premarital first. Missy, meanwhile, is counseling both Flo and Lori about their respective crises. The way that she count the way that she helps Flo is by faking a freak out of her own to have him talk her out of it, thus proving that he has what it takes. A bit convoluted, but I guess. What's really funny about Lori's subplot is. It seems like this would be a good time to introduce her parents, but no, her mother comes in later. They don't even go to this church, so 
why was their anniversary in the bulletin in the first place? And how did it take this long, if the anniversary goes in the bulletin every year, for Lori to notice that the year was didn't match up? And furthermore, isn't she the one who types the bulletin? Anyway, this new Lori is especially grating to me. The original actress who played Lori played the character as pretty high strung. It was kind of annoying, but this new actress dials this high strungness of Lori's up to 11, and oh my goodness gracious, you just want her to shut up! She rivals John. Yeah. What's really frustrating is Flo is so nervous because a church that he is considering pastoring for is sending representatives that night. And you know, of course, he's not going to take the gig because that's how the show works. But you could have built in the the plot cul-de-sac that are the last four episodes into this. They could have been coming to see Greg to talk to him about a temporary relocation. But that would require paying attention to your writing, both past and future, and this show fails spectacularly at that. Then there's an episode about a missionary trip in Africa. While on a video conference with her father, Kat reveals that a kid has been injured in a guerrilla warfare raid on a village and needs immediate treatment and needs to be flown out of the country ASAP. Meanwhile, John's wife and daughter feel that he's spending too much time at the church, because he is, and they want him to spend more time with them. But they are dissuaded when they see him taking part in the effort to get Kat, Carter, and the kid into the United States. Okay, a few problems here. How is a church treasurer and a local minister in a rinky-dink church going to be of any real use here. Shouldn't they be calling the U.S. Embassy or something? I, I really don't think that a small town church is going to be able to get somebody across the border with passes and all that fun stuff. And if this is an emergency medical situation, why are you flying him to the United States? That's a really long flight. You'd think he'd need to go somewhere a little closer and maybe on the same continent to get his immediate treatment. But the really strange part is in the last few minutes of the episode, the story just stops and we are treated to a slideshow of random photographs of children in Africa with no context while sweet music plays. It feels like it should be Sarah McLachlan, but no 1 no 800 number shows up. It's just generic slideshow and then back into the plot of the episode. They don't even do it at the end! It's interrupting the episode. Look, using the medium of fiction to inspire your audience to do charity work. That's a noble cause. When you abuse the medium you're using, you're doing it wrong. Oh, by the way, remember Lori's fiance, Matt? No. Hmm, I don't blame you, because it doesn't seem like the show does either. She left him quite unceremoniously at the altar. And then the next episode picks up with nobody talking about it. Instead, they're all hustling and bustling, enjoying a church bake sale and getting ready for a big church supper. And Greg, John, and Flo help themselves to a snack. And even though we're supposed to be able to read what the label says, we can't. Uh, well done there. Uh, it turns out those were rum balls. And... Our characters get drunk. Nathan, can you really get drunk eating rum balls? I'm not sure. I'm not that into alcohol-based confections. But I also don't care enough to look it up. Okay, fair enough. Due to a misunderstanding, again, 
Missy accidentally puts way too many peppers in everybody's food and completely ruins it. So between the food being inedible and the male staff of the church having giant hangovers at the, at the supper, people start getting angry. So Lori starts giving a big old speech about forgiveness. And then Matt just happens to walk in and he says something to her, which I assume is I forgive you, but... I can't really hear it for the life of me because he's not Mike. Just just to make sure, we, we tried. We we rewound the scene a couple of times to try to pick up what he said. We couldn't do it. Anyway, after that, he leaves. Wasn't Matt a great character? I learned so much about him. You know, like, uh... How Greg thought he and um... Lori were great together. He was a human male he, of the Caucasian persuasion. He delivered mail to the church, and that's how they met. You know, there's disposable love interests, and then there's Matt. Seriously, I thought Meg Ryan love interests were disposable, but oh, come on. That's where Meg Ryan herself is disposable. That doesn't count. But the most infuriating episode of all would have to be the season two finale. Let's get into it. So a criminal whose crimes have not been revealed to the audience just yet uh, wants to worship at Merlin Church. No, oh, sorry, it's not Merlin Church anymore. It's whatever the new church's name is, sorry. And no other church in town will have him. And Greg says that they have to welcome him because he has the right to worship the Lord just like everybody else does. Okay, I, I could get behind this. I mean... After all, how bad can it be? It, it, it's a sitcom. So what? He's a thief, a, a junkie. Child molester. Oh. Oh. Pastor Greg is going to talk to us about child molesting. This is going to hurt. Using the medium of fiction to discuss difficult topics is a good idea. When is it appropriate, if ever, to allow truly harmful people to reintegrate into society? How much anger are we supposed to bear for someone else's pain? But this show has not demonstrated even a quarter of the tact necessary to handle things like this. So, Greg goes to talk to Joe to see why he feels so personally about this. Come to find out, Joe's brother was molested, and it has affected the way he, he's grown up into adulthood. Alright, how's Greg going to talk his way out of this one? Well, that homeless angel comes back. And this time, he's in Greg's home, and Greg is fully aware of who he is. Somehow. Great. Why he's still maintaining the charade of being a homeless man. And I don't care. The angel tells Greg that he needs to tell Joe to give himself time to grieve, and this too shall pass. What? Oh, good. Angelic advice is on the same level as a cross-stitched pillow. Neat. Greg's answer for everything is ultimately generic platitudes. This too shall pass? What the heck is that supposed to mean? And when he talks to Joe, Joe doesn't understand because his brother's not dead. Really? He doesn't know what that means? I'm sorry, I don't buy it. Anyway, all is forgiven, apparently, because our final shot of the episode is Joe praying with this criminal. And the criminal is kept off screen, so we never actually have to see this person. Stop, stop. What? Joe's problem wasn't that he couldn't forgive the criminal. It was that he was concerned with the safety of the people of the church. Oh, yeah. He was affected 
by how he had by what had happened to his brother, yes. But it's not that he never gave himself a chance to grieve. You're just infantilizing this character because it makes it easier to deal with his objections that way. That is incredibly patronizing. Yeah. Meanwhile... Oh, there's more. Greg and Missy are trying to figure out if they can conceive a child or if they should adopt. As you may have noticed, Pastor Greg has some issues with focus. Yeah. You only have a half hour, and you can't res you can't handle either of these topics well by tackling both of them in that time span. Mm -mm. As it so happens, Missy does become pregnant at the same time as they are approved for an adoption. Oh, and, uh, Mac is also pregnant. I didn't even know she was married. Uh, no, I think she has a boyfriend. Oh, ho, ho, ho. drama in the church office. But, judging off of the fact that season three goes back to Merlin Church, it looks like this cliffhanger is not going to get resolved either. So, what was the point? Again. Okay, it is entirely possible that season three does pick up with this cliffhanger. But, I wouldn't count on it. And I can't find season three anywhere on the internet, and I don't care enough to try. We can't find season three. I happened to have the second season on DVD, and this one said, let's try to find season one online. And we did through a really bad streaming service. Season three, though, vanished into the wind, and you know what? I'm okay with that. If I never have to see season three, it'll be too soon. And just like in season one, the production value is atrocious. The sets are incredibly cheap. There's one point where Greg walks into a wall and the wall actually shakes. And the sound mixing through this whole show is really bad. Sound mixing is your friend. We can't make out what people are saying a lot of the time, and subtitles aren't an option on either the DVD or the streaming service we tried, so we can't, so you can't use subtitles to help you figure out what people are saying. Oh, also, there was this episode where they did a karaoke thing, and it was so badly lip-synced, it was comical. The show is hilarious for all the wrong reasons, I suppose, and that's being kind. What's especially insulting is Greg Robbins, in interviews on the DVD, said that their show wasn't picked up by most networks because they used the J word. No. No. Your show was hot garbage. You can't just hide behind the fact that you're just a humble little show and we're just proud of our religion. You have to put some effort into your thing. And ironically enough, Jesus himself actually doesn't come up all that much. God does. But there really aren't as many mentions of Jesus in the show, which again is kind of funny considering he's supposedly the executive producer here. Hey, Nathan. Yeah. You want to see the worst worship song ever? Okay. You see, as it turns out, taking something that's popular and then inserting Jesus into it doesn't make it any good. If anything, it just makes you look cheap and lazy and very unoriginal. You're not making sitcoms better. You're making Christianity worse. This is one of those shows that's so bad you almost swear it was made as a parody of Christian entertainment. But no, no, this is the real thing. Greg Robbins might be a nice guy, but as far as his directing abilities go, he's definitely no Robert Duvall. He's more of a Tommy Wiseau, just without the accent. The, the show has almost no redeeming qualities. Season one, some episodes could have skated by with just a 
bad rating, but then season two comes along and drops the whole thing down to a sarcastic applause. What I find especially infuriating is people who will defend this show by saying it's an underdog show trying hard. No. Star Trek the original series was an underdog show that was trying hard. Freaks and Geeks was an underdog show trying hard. Pitch. Gallivant. And what's really infuriating is there are some legitimately good shows out there that were canceled after one season, and somehow Pastor Greg squeezed by with three? It's insulting. It's insulting to these good shows. It's an insult to the word try. As far as I'm concerned, this entire affair was sarcastic applause. Thank you for joining us for Faith on Film. Hopefully we'll get to watch something next time that doesn't make me want to claw my eyes out. I'm Nathan. And I'm Stephanie. Hey, Nathan. Hmm. I want to watch Frasier or something. Let's go. Okay. Hey. All right, let's watch content, guys. I hate you.